Can we start early? Can I go ahead and get started? Everybody's back? Let's do this thing. Okay, so what is differentiated instruction? Uh, it's teacher responding to the learner's needs as individuals and also in small groups. In the past, what's the past? A long time ago. We teach to the masses. We teach to the large group. What we're required to do now is to be sure that we know our students and we know what their needs are as individuals and not just if they're auditory learner or visual learner, but um, know them in terms of their abilities, but also their interests. And then in small groups, so when you know your individual students, you can then begin to, you can group them homogeneously in like um, learning styles or in like abilities um, or heterogeneously in different learning styles or different abilities as an example, depending upon what your ultimate goal is. So why differentiate? So you drew some pictures of what differentiating instruction means to you. Why should we differentiate? So Our instruction. I would say to give the greatest chance of Success for all the different students in the Why is that important? It's obvious, but why is that important? Because we want our job. <laughs> we want to keep our job. That's, that's motivation. Thank you. I mean, I would hope the goal of, you know, for all of us want to become educators is to, I mean, to better prepare them for their future, be it college or Wave an opportunity. Tell me about it. Where are you talking about there? I mean, as he was saying, like going to college and all that, that's like opportunity. Like by giving it different ways of giving each student a different opportunity to interpret and gather the information. So you're giving each student an opportunity to gain the knowledge. Produce a level playing field for each student. What does that look? What do you mean by that? Tend to not go there. 
and a lot of our, you know, more kids are down in this area, but a lot of our schools have, you did the research and looking at their value added scores, ones and twos. So their achievement scores can be here, but their value added scores can be here. And frequently that's because of this situation. We're not taking these top level learners and boosting them up. So it's not only about helping these low level ones, but it's given these kids who really need the challenge. And now I remember the question I was going to ask you. How many of you have been in a class, whether college, high school, whatever grade level, and the instruction went over your head, you were completely lost, and you didn't get it, and the teacher just kept going on, and you were left in the dust. Does that ever happen to anybody? That's a terrible, terrible feeling. And that teacher may not have even known that that was the case for you, because you know, as a, as a well-raised person and, and whatnot, well-behaved, you might have been just perfectly, uh, you know, just behaved very well in class, didn't act out, maybe a little shy, didn't ask questions, and you just sat there and maybe nodded your head, or maybe you were totally bored out of your mind and were falling asleep and they just didn't care. But if we differentiate, one of the reasons to differentiate is making sure that we don't do to students what sometimes has been done to us those students that slip through the cracks. We don't want that to happen to our students. There will be times in your career, especially if you're the teacher that cares and makes a difference, that you will have students that will come to you and say, you're the reason why I have this success, or you're the reason why I went into science or music, or you're the reason why I want to be a teacher, or you're the reason why I did not because you do make a difference and it's by really paying attention to who they are and what they need and it's not just about the content as secondary teachers we're all about you know we love we have passion for our subject and we should but it's about knowing your students knowing what they need and doing what you can to help them and if you don't know then you get help you get your own help resources so for whom do we differentiate our instruction? Who needs differentiated instruction? Say it again? Everybody. Why? Everybody learns differently. Say again? Everybody learns differently. Everybody learns differently? Well, what if I'm a good, I'm an A-B student. Do I need differentiated instruction? Maybe more challenging? Both my attention. I might be an English language learner. There might be any number of things. Sometimes I need differentiated instruction because I'm like Kyle and I work too many hours. I work, 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 work. I work because I close every night. And then when I got to be at school at 7.30 in the morning, I'm exhausted because by the time I got home, I was too wired. I couldn't sleep because I had to stay, uh, drink coffee, to stay up all night. And then first period gets there and I am tired. And I, as a teacher, might need to differentiate some instruction for Kyle because of the number of hours he's working. Because he's exhausted in the morning. He probably keep his eyes open. So all your students come with stories and backgrounds. So it's not, it's not even just about your learners in terms of their abilities or which language they speak or their learning preference. Some of you have seen this. Differentiated classroom, what it looks like. Tell me what you've seen. What does a differentiated classroom look like? Well, some students are given different materials to work along with, or maybe even given extra assignments. Well, extra might not be the right word. Slightly different assignments that are kind of along the same line, but go in more detail. Okay, so different. Not everyone's necessarily doing the same thing. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Yes. Dylan? It's not necessarily a physical change, but more of like a teaching change, like okay. modifications in general. That's what we use them for to assist. I mean, in the art room, you have not necessarily different standards, but you have different levels, right? So there's the ones who are new. So you have them do just the basics, get this step. But the more advanced students, you want them to go out of their way. Like, so it's more of just encouraging to continue because they'll probably finish early, right? So that's what we would do in the art room. I think I'm answering your question. I could be totally wrong. 
You were answering my question. But you mentioned physical space. Can you differentiate your physical spaces? Group work, individual work. Group work, individual work. Larger presentation groups. Okay. What about the way the desks are arranged? Yeah. What do you think, Kayla? The rules are spinning. Well, I wasn't really thinking about as much the desk, but like the actual, like what's hanging up in the room and like the activities they do. Like I noticed the first class I observed was my mentor teacher. She does a lot of like writing and turning in work. But the math room that I observed, she did a lot of like creating work too, and that was displayed so they could also go back, like they made it, but they could also go back and look at it. So that was displayed in the classroom. So I feel like it's not just the arrangement of desks or like the instruction, but like the resources that they have placed around the room too. Like there's a textbook section where you can go over there and you can sit and read your textbook. Like they have like Cozy corner for right, reading, you know, right, like right. for elementary school. We're not too old for that, are but we? yeah, but they have like that section of the room, and then but they also have like the section of the room where they have the hands-on stuff, mm -hmm. and then they have the work that they've displayed, so you can go back and. Look and that was it. part of your journal today, right? Was looking for student work displayed. So there's lots of different ways that um, classrooms can be differentiated. Okay, so we've talked about styles and incorporating styles, so you can uh, rotate your styles, but you can also be multimodal, so we've talked a little bit about that. Now this is something that some of you have mentioned, when we look at tier instruction, and this has become popular in the last couple of years. So what you have here at tier one is students learn roughly at grade level or above. This is how they determine RTI. What does RTI stand for? Response to intervention. Response to intervention. So there's some sort of intervention that's supposed to happen, and so it's response to intervention. So students learn at roughly grade level or above. So this is where most of your students fall, is in level one, tier one. Tier two, students lag well behind their peers. They demonstrate weak progress on screening measures, these testing measures, and require some form of intervention. So a smaller group of students fall into tier two. Tier three, students lag behind their peers by one or more years, demonstrate very weak progress on screening measures and require intense intervention. So um, in, at the high school level, we have RTI time that some of you have indicated is not very effective. Those of you that are at Eagle Ball, you're going to be in K through 12 classes. You're going to see response to intervention in this tiering going on. It's done beautifully. So they have students that, like a group of students that are doing activities that include the majority of the students, so these are the ones that are on grade level. Then you're going to have another teacher working with a group at this level, another at this level. It tends to be on uh, mathematics and reading that they're focusing on because those are the areas that are tested. So one idea is to look at where they are. Matthew, you talked about not just like different assignments. So if you've got uh, learners that are really struggling, and it was the whiteboard that was here that I guess was um, Ashley's and Jacob's group, where you had uh, one, like lots of instruction, and one with not as much instruction. So a lot of scaffolding here for, say, level two, level, uh, level or tier three, or uh, tier three or tier two. And then you might over here for your tier one not have as much instruction. Um, I'm not an expert, of course, but I like to think of it like figuring out each one's zone of proximal development. So talk to me about zone of proximal development. Well, Vygotsky says that there's a, an area where a student can get, but they'll need some assistance to do that. So if we're, if we're looking at all of the students where they are and where they need our help, then we'll automatically be differentiating instruction. So it's this notion that can't get there on our own. It's not so hard that we can't ever get to it, but if you, have, you provide just enough assistance, just enough scaffolding so that they can be successful. Productive struggle, right? But you got to know where your students are so you know what that scaffolding needs to be. Good. So, tiered assignments. This allows students to begin where they are. So one way to differentiate is starting with beginning students with where they are, where do they fit in this tier as it relates to their peers using measures, scaling measures. You can differentiate the process. So let's look at these images. So we, we can differentiate based on 
where the students are. We can differentiate based on the process. So what do these pictures tell you? What do these images invoke as we think about process? Say again? Concept map. Okay, what about it? The girl with the papers around her. Okay, so how? A central idea that spreads out into smaller ideas that are connected to other smaller ideas. Okay, so how's that differentiated process? Nine boxes, and she has to work through that grid uh, throughout the week. 
and she picks a box and then she has to pick another, another box that touches it and she has to go around and, and do it that way. But by the end of the week, she's completed four or five of the boxes yeah. out of all of them. This is a bigger box, but something along. Yeah. So this sort of choice board here, you can't, you can't read this. So, um, write, characterize, create, different, different right. ways of, of demonstrating. So you get choice, but once you use something, um, and so sometimes it's choice, but sometimes uh, you perhaps you group students in a way so that your advanced learners can have something that's more complex. Maybe it's not something that's more uh, more work, but it's more complex. So there's a maybe a specific product that you want them to create. They still got choice within that product, but a certain thing. And let's say that you've got some. Uh, students that are at this end down here, and it doesn't need to be as complex. So sometimes it's a matter of um, indicating what those products will be as well. I am not anywhere against differentiation or anything like that, but my curiosity comes since we know that uh, testing is the biggest thing. How do we incorporate such learning, but still have to force them to test in only one way? So, like, we could test them in different ways, you know what I mean? But we only have one way of testing. We make them write it on a sheet of paper or click it on a computer. So, great, but by differentiation, we're not preparing them for the test as well, which I'm not saying that right. only You're a writing a test. Valid point. I'm not saying that writing tests are the only way to do it. Not at all. I'm just saying... How do, we, how do we incorporate differentiation and instruction but being forced to give them a test that's only written and it be productive? Is it the point of differentiating instruction, making sure that they gather the information they retain it so when it comes to the test time, that's a different topic, isn't it? Because once they know the knowledge, would it be easier for them to regurgitate it? Right, but wouldn't it be easier for you to regurgitate it in the way that you learned it rather than in the way that you're being told to do it? Well, like, I would I would be able to perform better if I could physically do something or say something. I'm not going to be able to write it all that great. So it's all about retrieval. And in, when, when it comes to learning, you have um, working memory and you have long-term memory and things that are in working memory, like... Um, like if somebody were to give you their phone number or a series of things, I can like hang on to it for a while. And in learning, if you're going to really learn something, it goes from working memory into long-term memory, right? So that you can so that you can retrieve it, you can access it. So I think what Benton is saying is that through differentiating instruction, you help it get from working memory into long-term memory. And so then you have to have this retrieval. And what you're saying is, well, if, if you have learned it this way, but you're tested another way, is that going to translate? And so certainly it depends on the student, but it's also your retrieval practice. How do you get back to it? So that's a really big thing right now in um, learning theories is, um, is this um, interleaved uh, experiences, which means that we are connecting what we're learning to other learnings and coming back and bringing all these different, you remember I talked about the pathways, the neural pathways, and having all these different experiences to help get that thing into working memory and practice the retrieval so you can get it back. And so, yes, it might be a multiple choice test, but it also, there's a lot of um, uh, performance based. The, the 10 Ready is now. Uh, constructed response, so you have to be able to write. So as a teacher, when I am doing all of these, um, this differentiated instruction, I'm going to be included in a lot of writing, showing your work, having some discussions, and helping students to retrieve that information, and coming back and practicing. So we've left this topic in genetics, now we're moving into this other topic, and so I'm going to keep trying to tie it back to these things. Again, retrieval practice in different ways of looking at it in your mind and understanding it so you can get back to it. Not just for tests, but that's part of it. Do you have a comment? Uh, I have the staff at work. You can. Oh, I didn't. I, if you were okay. trying to wrap things up, I didn't want yeah, to. Yeah, well, I got just a few more minutes. Um, all I was going to say is that it seems to me like there's not enough time, time. to give the students what they should have. You know, it's mile kind of wide, inch deep, right? There's time is always, always, always an issue. And in Rutherford County, 
We have to identify power standards, these um, essential learnings. You will not, in all likelihood, be able to cover all the standards. As a professional learning community, you're going to have to be looking at what is most essential. What is your guaranteed and viable curriculum? What is, what are the things that all students must learn and be able to do before they go to the fourth grade or the tenth grade or whatever it is? The time is an issue. Okay, so we're talking about starting with students where they are. We're talking about differentiating the uh, process. We're talking about differentiating the product, so giving them choices or uh, identifying what those products need to be based on where they are. Um, we can also differentiate by their interests, by their learning profile, and by their readiness. So those are things that you can identify in your students. So do I need to, do I need to elaborate on interest learning pro profile or readiness? Okay, so I'm gonna keep scrolling. We can, we can use flexible group. What all students will do, what most students will do, and what some students will do. So we can be looking at grouping. We can be looking at homogeneous grouping. Uh, and that might be same-sex grouping. It might be ability grouping. It might be the same interest. It might be the same learning profile. We can do heterogeneous grouping. Uh, mixing those up. It depends on what your ultimate goal is. Uh, are we have any English folks here? Okay, so uh, Raft, uh, Carol Tomlinson is a uh, differentiating instruction guru. This is one of her things. So Raft for writing. So the R is for role, so that you assume a role. Like I'm going to be a newspaper reporter from the Civil War, and I'm going to um, write from that role. My audience is going to be um, the readers in the uh, Confederacy, and the topic is going to be the Battle of Franklin, and then whatever, you know, it's going to be a newspaper article, for example. So you can do this uh, a way to differentiate, and you can let students choose, like if you have a certain topic, but this can go for history or any, any number of things, but um, you can let them choose, you know, have some choices in this. Okay. All right, so I want to show you a video.
I might have students that are struggling very much with the material, and then in the same class, I have students that are hoping to go on to take AP Biology and AP Chemistry next year. It's hard to do in one class. How do you challenge your top students while not leaving anybody behind? Point six. Teachers must be able to adapt their lessons so they can be understood by students with different aptitudes and abilities. A teacher who differentiates responds to the diverse learning needs of her students. This increases the likelihood that all students will learn key concepts. So today we're continuing our gas laws discussion. Laura has begun to differentiate, designing lessons that address the multiple intelligences in her classroom. Okay, pressure is constant. Your volume went down. What had to have happened to your temperature? It went down. Some students are really strong math students, so they're going to really latch on to that, those equations and the math behind it. And other students, they need to be able to see things, and they need to be able to see examples in order for them to really learn and understand the concept. Those are all different ways that hopefully we will help all different types of learners, whether they be auditory, sensory, or they like to write things down and just do the math behind it. Still, Laura struggles to keep all her students engaged and working to their maximum potential. It's easier for me to hit on a different type of learner in my lesson, but it's, it's harder for me to work with students at very different ability levels in one particular class. I can count on one hand the number of times I give an exact same homework assignment to everybody in the room in a whole school year. Rick Wormley is a science teacher from Virginia and an expert on differentiating instruction. Some kids need batting, some catching, some need to lift some weights, some running, whatever it is, but not everybody's doing batting practice. You change the practice according to what your children need at the time. Different instruction is kind of the pragmatist credo, whatever works. You've got this one lesson you're going to do. You're sensitive to, is it working or not? And if the kids aren't learning to the level they do, what do I need to do to adjust it? It's having such a diverse repertoire of responses that I can respond to the needs of my students. So a lot of people call differentiated instruction responsive teaching. Laura consults with Rick via Skype to get some practical tips on differentiating instruction. Hey, Laura, how are you? Good, how are you? Great, ready to talk some differentiated instruction. What do you have for me today? So I have a very diverse group of students, um, some at the very, very high end of, of the class who were really accelerated and like to self-learn the material before it even is uh, introduced in class. So I'm having a little trouble with really hitting everybody and making sure that everybody has that appropriate challenge. How do you know these students are accelerated? They're preparing for the SAT 2 already. Yeah. So they're taking a review class. So they've already been taught in a review way what the topic is. So they've gone through the book, they've gone through practice questions, they've had homeworks on it, and I haven't taught a thing yet. Before a teacher can differentiate successfully, she must accurately assess the level of her student's competence. Assessment has to be accurate when it comes to class. If I make a decision based on false assessment data, the whole enterprise of teaching and learning very successfully, let alone grading, and whatever happens to the child's future, will also be based on this faulty premise. Assessment should be continuous to track student progress. Teachers can pass out an informal questionnaire before teaching a new concept to gauge student knowledge. Use ongoing assessments like exit slips or classroom discussion to see who has struggled. Make sure the assessment accurately tests the concept being taught. Every problem I write in my tests and my quizzes, I'm going to say, and which standard or benchmark or learning target is that? And the learning targets, where is the evidence of that? And is that ample evidence? We have taught all the time that a grade is far more accurate when it's clear and consistent over time, not one snapshot moment in time. So how do you deal with a variety of readiness levels in the same 43 minutes or 86 minutes? Correct. All right. Well, how familiar are you with tiering and scaffolding? Have you studied any of that in your, your undergraduate or, gra or in service training? Not formally yet, no. A teacher who tiers a lesson teaches the same concept to everyone, but varies the level of complexity to engage all students. Let's choose one right now that you have to teach, and let's figure out, okay, what's for the basic class? 
And what could we do for the more advanced students? So we just finished up gas laws. Okay, so name one that you would want to get across. Uh, the ideal gas law. And explain that for all those listening, myself <laughs> included. So it is the equation um, that's used for ideal gases that allows us to, to figure out the, the pressure, temperature, volume relationships while also changing the number of moles of gas. So what's the basic thing you want students to be able to do at the end of that lesson? Really just be able to look at and read a word problem and be able to extract the information from the word problem to put it into the formula and solve for an unknown. Can you have word problems where there's lots of extraneous information that might confuse the students? They and, love that. Right. So I could have, for those advanced kids, some complex word problems where it's not so obvious how you manipulate everything, and some where it's very direct, very forward, and then slowly segue from one to the other for that earlier introductory group. Turing a lesson allows all students to experience success. Students of all ages crave confidence. And if they don't get it, they feel humiliated, they feel hurt, they feel angry. So if I do something developmentally appropriate and they shine, they understand that element of it, they're very motivated. So now, next steps, right away, what's going to happen for you in your lesson design in the next, like, two or three days? What are some things you actually will change or try? I think I definitely want to try diverging or splitting up the class in a sense in an organized way. You could do a global lesson for 10 to 15 minutes and then really let people expand their own ways. These advanced students really go off on another level that you've prepared for them, much more challenging, and these other kids are much more rudimentary. Then the two groups come together, or three groups, whatever it might be. They come back together and summarize what they're able to pull out a salient from that. I need to mix and match. I will put higher performing with lower performing sometimes. I'll put all higher performing, sometimes all lower performing. It's going to be very, very dynamic, and you won't always be in the same group. Readiness level isn't the only way to group students in a differentiated classroom. Students can also be grouped based on interests or learning styles. We talk about groups, small groups of the class, flexible groups of the class, as having these semi-permeable membranes. They're very dynamic. They're not static in their membership. And students can change that as long as you present evidence you're ready to move on to this other station. Anything else? I really definitely want to go more into the research as well and try to get, get my hands on some differentiated instruction books and to see what's out there. There are books out there on, on differentiated instruction, but you want to find the ones with chapters on scaffolding and tiering. And you can't just read one book and suddenly you know how to differentiate instruction. So I recommend usually three or four books in the very first year, and you pull the stuff that works.
think that you can differentiate in your classroom. You know, everyone should know what class you're going to be teaching. For, those, for, for your right. lesson, for, yeah, for your learning segment, thinking about possible ways, and you know, it's, it's hypothetical to some degree because you may not know exactly what you're going to be doing. But write down at least two ways that you can differentiate your instruction. And then I also would like for you to write down uh, something that you're concerned about or a question or that, you know, something you're uncertain about as it relates to differentiating instruction. And I'll turn the lights back. What was that say? So something that you have a question about or that you're concerned about as it relates to differentiating instruction, something you're just not quite sure about yet. So in the first portion, mm -hmm. the differentiated learning, is that for like the cooperative thing that we're doing, teaching? Yeah, for your learning? learning segment that you're going to be doing. Okay. So thinking, you may not know exactly what you're going to be doing, but you know, you probably have a mentor teacher, you know your subject area. Right. So what are some ways that you could potentially differentiate during that time? 